Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop, here at chess.com, and I've been teaching chess to beginners and intermediate players since 1984, helping them to achieve a higher level in chess excellence. One of the means by which we accomplish that task is by evaluating the games that they have played. And um, normally my job involves a lot of criticism and that's sometimes hard to do. Constantly telling a person what was wrong with their thinking and it's important to identify our thinking errors and, and deficiencies. But it's always wonderful when we can showcase the progress of our students. And so today's video is going to be entitled Margaret's Masterpiece, Mark Mitch 9, Margaret uh, by name, is playing against Tassim Akhtas. And this game was played three days ago on December the 6th, 2020. And I've been working with Margaret for uh, several months now and she's made good progress and we hope to see her make additional progress. Well, we're gonna look at this game, which was just a remarkable um, game by Margaret, a game in which she scored an accuracy of 94.42 and a best move rate of 51.9%. So I know you'll be as glad to see it as I was when we looked at it earlier in the week and when I looked at it again this morning. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Um, Margaret playing e4, e5 by her opponent, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop to c4. Bishop to c4 is the Italian game. And it's called the Italian game because it was first played by the Italian chess masters way back in the 16th century. The idea is to develop the king's bishop to a nice strong diagonal, the A2 G8 diagonal, and it also eyeballs the soft point at F7. And so depending on how the players continue, uh, the Italian game can uh, result in gambit play or an open game, or it can precede slower maneuvering play. The benefits of the Italian game are number one, that it provides natural play. Secondly, that it does focus on the center of the board. And of course, um, that's always important in the opening of the game. Um, and thirdly, it facilitates rapid development. The knight and bishop on the king's side are already out, and the king is ready to castle. Now, the drawbacks to the Italian game are that, first of all, because we bring this bishop so close to enemy territory, it might become exposed to attack. And even though we're controlling the center, we're not exerting as much pressure immediately on the center as we do in the Spanish game, which undermines the defense of the center by attacking the queen's knight. So, but we can certainly live with those drawbacks. Now, it might interest you to know that some famous practitioners of the Italian game include Giacchino Greco. And if you don't know that name, look it up. He was an Italian chess master and a writer way back in the early 17th century, but more up to date also playing this game several hundred years later is Grandmaster Sergei Tevyakov, and he was a Russian-born um, Dutch chess champion, 
and he also became the 2008 individual European chess champion. So it's not an opening that has um, lost its appeal. It's still being played today, 400 years after it was first uh, introduced to the highest level of chess. Okay. Now, h6 is the move that denotes the anti-fried liver defense. Well, it's played proactively in anticipation of knight g5 by white. A lot of times beginners end up getting their queen and their rook forked by the knight going to g5, then f7. And for this reason, Many beginners like to play h6 early on just to prevent any ideas of such an attack. But there are times for this kind of prophylaxis, but really this is not one of them because there are better ways of dealing with the fried liver attack. And so black should rather focus on developing and castling as the opening principles would dictate. For example, the Gioco Piano, Bishop C5, and the Two Knights Defense. Well, these are the best and most frequently choices, frequently played choices at the highest level in chess. Uh, h6 kind of wastes a move. d3 opens the door for the bishop to get out. Knight to f6. Knight to c3. And this is the last move from the encyclopedia that was played in this game. And you can find this opening, by the way, in volume C of your encyclopedia of chess openings. Section number 55. Here black plays a6. And again, this is a waste of time. These two pawn moves are unnecessary. Uh, the most common and sensible move from this position is to develop the bishop to c5 and to prepare to castle your king. Sorry about that. A6, though, is what was played, and Margaret castles her king. And now black plays yet another pawn move. We encourage the students, do not move your pawns in the beginning, except to get your bishops out of bed. Do not move your pawns in the beginning. Get all your other pieces out instead. And rise and shine, wake up your sleepy heads. Get your lazy pieces up out of bed. Rise and shine, wake up your sleepy heads. Get them into the board. Did I mention the importance of developing your pieces with moves like bishop to c5 and castling? In case I didn't mention it, let me do so now. Well, this is just a one-move wonder. It does hit the bishop, but the bishop retreats safely to b3 and still has good influence ac across the center of the board. Bishop to b7, finally getting another bishop out. Pawn to a4, a very good and somewhat advanced idea. I know I just got finished saying do not move your pawns in the beginning except to get your bishops out. But since there's not really any great place to put the bishop, this would be okay. Margaret has the idea of opening the A file so she can save a move and not have to develop her rook. And so that's a very good idea. Black wisely avoids creating a breach on the A file and instead plays to b4, attacking the white queen's knight, which moves to d5, right into the center of the board. 
knight takes knight and bishop takes knight and that's going to be um, a strong move it threatens to capture the knight uh, the pawn here with the knight this is undefended so if knight takes pawn knight takes knight bishop takes bishop with an attack on the rook or knight, bishop takes knight bishop takes bishop knight takes pawn both good ideas bishop to d6 and black is worried about this attack against his e-man rightfully so but this is not the best way to deal with this attack because it inflicts the bishop with a serious case of what I call tall pawn syndrome. In other words, this bishop is functioning as nothing more than a tall pawn. He can't go in these two directions, and now if he ever moves, that pawn is vulnerable again. It also blocks this pawn in, not that it matters now that the other bishop is fianchettoed, but all in all, it's not the wisest use of the bishop. A better way to defend this pawn is to go ahead and develop your queen, and now the bishop's free to go to a better and more active square. Well, bishop to d6 was played, and bishop to e3, getting the last minor out of bed, Black castles, c3. Pawn takes pawn, and pawn takes pawn. Queen to f6 is now played, and rook to b1, a very good move. Rooks love to be on open files. This couldn't have been a better place for the rook. Rook a to b8, ready to not only defend the bishop, but to challenge this rook on b1. And c4 is a good move because it threatens to play c5, but whenever you move a pawn, you might gain something, but you often lose something. And notice, whereas this pawn was prohibiting the knight from any kind of entry into white's territory, by moving the pawn, these two squares become weakened, particularly the b4 square. And so though it's a good move because it has potential attacking value, um, keeping the pawn back is probably more resistant. Generally speaking, you do not want to grant your opponent access points into your territory. Um, what else could she have played here? Well, she could have improved her queen either to d2 or e2. Um, connecting the rooks, maybe prepare to double the rooks on the b file. Those are some ideas. It's not a bad move, but it does allow knight to b4, which her opponent failed to play. With c5, white basically laid out the welcome mat to play knight to b4. It can't be taken as it's defended by the bishop. Um, so white would be left with bishop takes bishop and rook takes bishop. And black has managed equality for the most part. Maybe still the smidgenest of edges for, black, for white because of the lack of um, activity of the other bishop. But all in all, black's looking good here. He's ready to double on the open file. He's ready to play a5 and cement the knight on this square. Very strong square for black, very weak for white. It's a weak square because white has no pawns that can attack it. Okay, well, knight h5 it is, and 
Pawn to c5. The entire purpose of c4 was to play to c5. And black should have just moved his bishop to safety. With this move, white's only problem now is deciding which of three good moves she should play. Any one of these moves is winning for white. Uh, Bishop e7 was definitely necessary for black to stay in this game. All right, let's see what she chose. Rook takes rook. Very good move. Rook takes rook. And now the bishop pawn takes the king's bishop. Now you do have to be careful not to play the wrong capture. And so you want to look at this very carefully. Well, in this position, capturing the light squared bishop is the wrong capture. Because after bishop to f8, well, queen to c2 can be played, but the knight can get back into the game with knight b3. And after queen c4 and a5, and rook to b1 super attacking the knight, well, rook to b4 is a very active way to hold on to positional equality. And um, white's edge is completely gone now. So a very good decision to capture the dark squared bishop. Meanwhile, this bishop is still in danger. Uh, he captured the pawn. He probably should have saved his bishop, but even so, after pawn takes c7, rook c8, queen b1, knight back into the game with knight to c6, um, not rook takes c7, queen b8 check, and you lost your rook for a pawn. But knight to c6 once bishop to b6 is played securing the pawn white has a solid advantage here um so right i mean i would have saved my bishop but really at this point it's hard for black to play any good moves queen takes the pawn pawn takes the bishop and barring any blunders from white, it should be a matter of time from here. Queen takes the pawn, knight to h4, and her plan is to bring the queen toward the king and create a super attack against the magic square. Tassim played pawn to e4, he probably should have at least gotten his knight back into the game. Knight c6. Pawn to e4 was played. Margaret completely ignores that and plays her plan. Get in line with the king. Followed by knight f5. That is a an enormous threat because it's not only attacking the magic square but it's threatening to play the fork of the king and the queen. And you'll notice that if the knight can get to e7, the king and the queen will be in danger, so the queen will be lost. Well, bishop to, uh, bishop, rook. Bishops have the pointy hats, rook have the flat hats. Rook to b6. And this moves directly in the line with the bishop. But Margaret totally ignores it and plays knight to f5. I'm giving that a double exclamation point. Yes, rook takes bishop is also clearly winning. 
But Margaret demonstrates a wonderful maxim that was taught to us by world champion Emmanuel Lasker. The wise advice that says when you found a good move, look again and see if you can find a better move. Well, that's exactly what she did here. Because of the threat, it's a double threat, threatening checkmate on G7, and also threatening the fork on E7. Well, for that reason, the only way to deal with both of those threats will leave this rook here for the bishop to capture it later. So this is a very nice non-capture. Well, black missed the only way to stop both threats and played rook g6. Perhaps you saw the only way to stop both the threat of queen takes pawn on g7 as well as the threat of knight to e7 check. Well, the only move that stops both of those threats is queen to e5. And then I'll take, well, maybe then I'll even take this. <laughs> I might take the rook. I might take this pawn. Again, white's only problem is figuring out which winning move to play. Okay. Rook g6 is an empty threat against this queen, and it only deals with the threat of queen takes g7 mate. Knight e7, double exclamation point. Not panicking just because her queen is in danger. The queen can't be captured by the rook since that move does not remove the check. King to h7. Now I worry about my queen, right? Watch what Margaret does and be ready to applaud. Queen takes rook check. Give her a round of applause, ladles and jelly spoons. Well done, Margaret. Give yourself a pat on the back. What a great move this is. It recognizes that this queen will still be in danger because the king is in check and must get out of check. You definitely do not want to um, say, okay, I guess I'll take the queen and let you take my queen. Well, white amazingly would still be winning here, but again, the better choice has been found and is so much more decisive to play queen takes rook check. White, uh, black has to get out of check, and the queen is still standing there. White, right in the wide open where it can be captured. And after c6, knight b6, g5, knight takes pawn. Black resigned. And what we're going to do here is put this position into my computer. And we're going to let the computer play against the computer. Now, if you're interested in chess lessons, please email me at the address in the description below. Or if you'd like one of your games analyzed on video in this format, please contact me. These are both premium services that I provide to donors to my channel. And so if you're willing to donate to the channel, I'll make that service available to you. It can be one of your own games, or it can be the game of a favorite chess master or grandmaster. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. And until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now. Checkmate. What a beautiful checkmate. <laughs>